Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The Life and Achievements of Don Quixote de la Mancha is a Spanish epic novel by Miguel de Cervantes. Originally published in two parts, in 1605 and 1615, its full title is The Ingenious Gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha. A founding work of Western literature, it is often labeled as the first modern novel and one of the greatest works ever written. Don Quixote is also one of the most translated books in the world. If you enjoy our program, Please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 84 What happened to Sancho, by the way, with other matters which you will have no more to do than to see? Sancho pursued his way until the night overtook him within half a league of the Duke's castle. However, as it was summertime, he was not much uneasy and chose to go out of the road with a design to stay there till the morning. But while he sought some place where he might rest himself, he and Dapple tumbled of a sudden into a very deep hole among the ruins of an old building. As he was falling, he fancied himself sinking down into some bottomless abyss, but he was in no such danger, for by the time he had descended somewhat lower than 18 feet, Dapple made a full stop at the bottom and his rider found himself still on his back without the least hurt in the world. Presently, Sancho began to consider the condition of his bones, held his breath, and felt all about him, and finding himself sound and in a whole skin, he thought he could never give heaven sufficient thanks for his wondrous preservation, for at first he gave himself over for lost and broken into a thousand pieces. He groped with both hands about the walls of the pit to try if it were possible to get out without help but he found them all so steep that there was not the least hold or footing to get up. This grieved him to the soul, and to increase his sorrow, Dapple began to raise his voice in a very piteous and doleful manner, which pierced his master's very heart, nor did the poor beast make such moan without reason, for to say the truth, he was but in a woeful condition. Woe's me, cried Sancho, what sudden and unthought of mischances every foot befalls poor wretches in this miserable world. Who would have thought that he who but yesterday saw himself seated on the throne of an island governor and had servants and vassals at his beck should today find himself buried in a pit without the least soul to help him or come to his relief? Here we are likely to perish with hunger, I and my ass, if we do not die before he of his bruises and I have grief and anguish. At least, I shall not be so lucky as was my master Don Quixote when he went down into the cave of the enchanter Montesinos. He found better fare there than he could have at his own house. The cloth was laid and his bed made, and he saw nothing but pleasant visions, but I am like to see nothing here but toads and snakes. Unhappy creature that I am, What have my foolish designs and whimsies brought me to? At length, after a whole night's lamenting and complaining at a miserable rate, the day came on, and its light having confirmed Sancho in his doubts of the possibility of getting out of that place without help, he again made a vigorous outcry to try whether any body might not hear him. But alas, all his calling was in vain, for all around there was nobody within hearing, and at first he gave himself over for dead and buried. He cast his eyes on Dapple, and seeing him extended on the ground, and sadly dejected, he went to him and tried to get him on his legs, which, with much ado, by means of his assistance, 
the poor beast did at last, being hardly able to stand. Then he took a lunch and a bread out of his wallet that had run the same fortune with him and giving it to the ass, who took it not at all amiss and made no bones of it. Here, said Sancho, as if the beast had understood him, a fat sorrow is better than a lean. At length, he perceived on one side of the pit a great hole, wide enough for a man to creep through stooping. He drew to it, and having crawled through on all fours, found that it led into a vault that enlarged itself the further it extended, which he could easily perceive, the sun shining in towards the top of the concavity. Having made this discovery, he went back to his ass, and like one that knew what belonged to digging, with a stone he began to remove the earth that was about the hole, and labored so effectually that he soon made a passage for his companion. Then taking him by the halter, he led him along through the cave, to try if he could not find a way to get out on the other side. Alas, said he to himself, what a heart of a chicken have I. This, which to me is a sad disaster, to my master Don Quixote would be a rare adventure. He would look upon these caves and dungeons as lovely gardens and glorious palaces and hope to be let out of these dark narrow cells into some fine meadow, while I, luckless, heartless wretch that I am, every step I take, expect to sink into some deeper pit than this and go down I do not know whither. Thus he went on, lamenting and despairing, and thought he had gone somewhat more than half a league, when at last he perceived a kind of confused light, like that of day, break in at some open place, but which, to poor Sancho, seemed a prospect of a passage into another world. But here we leave him a while, and return to Don Quixote, who entertained and pleased himself with the hopes of a speedy combat between him and Donna Rodriguez's enemy, whose wrongs he designed to see redressed. Chapter 85 Which treats of matters that relate to this history, and no other. The Duke and Duchess resolved that Don Quixote's challenge against their vassal should not be ineffectual, and the young man being fled into Flanders to avoid having Donna Rodriguez to his mother-in-law, they made choice of a Gascoigne lackey named Tosilos to supply his place and gave him instructions how to act his part. Two days after, the Duke acquainted Don Quixote that within four days his antagonist would meet him in the lists armed at all points like a knight, to maintain that the damsel lied through the throat in saying that he had ever promised her marriage. Don Quixote was mightily pleased with this news, promising himself to do wonders on this occasion, and esteeming an extraordinary happiness to have such an opportunity to shew, before such noble spectators, how great were his valor and his strength. Cheered and elevated with these hopes, he waited for the end of these four days, which his eager impatience made him think so many ages. It happened one morning, as he was riding out to prepare an exercise against the time of battle, that Rosinante pitched his feet near the brink of a deep cave, insomuch that, if Don Quixote had not used the best of his skill, he must infallibly have tumbled into it. Having escaped that danger, he was tempted to look into the cave without alighting, and wheeling about, rode up to it. While he was satisfying his curiosity and seriously musing, he thought he heard a noise within, and thereupon listening, he could distinguish these words, which in a doleful tone arose out of the cavern, Oh, above there! Is there no good Christian that hears me? No charitable knight or gentleman that will take pity of a sinner buried alive, a poor governor without a government? Don Quixote fancied he heard Sancho's voice, which did not a little surprise him, and for his better satisfaction, raising his voice as much as he could, Who is that below? cried he, Who is that complains? Who should it be, to his sorrow, cried Sancho, but the most wretched Sancho Panza, governor, for his sins and for his unlucky errantry of the island of Barataria, formerly squire to the famous knight Don Quixote de la Mancha. 
These words redoubled Don Quixote's surprise and increased his amazement. I conjure thee, said he, as I am a Catholic Christian, to tell me who thou art. And if thou art a soul in pain, let me know what thou wouldst have me to do for thee. For since my profession is to assist and succor all that are afflicted in this world, it shall also be so to relieve and help those who stand in need of it in the other and who cannot help themselves. Surely, sir, answered he from below, he that speak to me should be my master Don Quixote. By the tone of your voice it can be no man else. My name is Don Quixote, replied the knight, and I think it my duty to assist not only the living but the dead in their necessities. Tell me then who thou art, for thou feest me with astonishment. Why then, replied the voice, I make oath that I am Sancho Panza your squire, and that I never was dead yet in my life. But only having left my government, for reasons and causes which I have not leisure yet to tell you, last night unluckily I fell into this cave, where I am still, and dapple with me, that will not let me tell a lie, for, as a farther proof of what I say, he is here. Now what is strange, immediately, as if the ass had understood what his master said, to back his evidence, he fell a brain so obstreperously that he made the whole cave ring again. A worthy witness, cried Don Quixote, I know his bray, and I know thy voice too, my Sancho. I find thou art my real squire, stay, therefore, till I go to the castle, which is hard by and fetch more company to help thee out of the pit into which thy sins doubtless have thrown me. Make haste, I beseech you, sir, quoth Sancho, and come again as fast as you can, for I can no longer endure to be here buried alive. Don Quixote went with all speed to the castle, and gave the Duke and Duchess an account of Sancho's accident, whilst they did not a little wonder at it though they conceived he might easily enough fall in at the mouth of the cave, which had been their time out of mind. But they were mightily surprised to hear he had abdicated his government before they had an account of his coming away. In short, they sent ropes and other conveniences by their servants to draw him out, and at last, with much trouble and labor, both he and his dapple were restored to the light of the sun. They then proceeded to the castle, where the Duke and Duchess waited for them in the gallery. As for Sancho, he would not go up to see the Duke till he had seen his ass in the stable and provided for him, for he said the poor beast had but sorry entertainment in his last night's lodging. This done, away he went to wait on his lord and lady, and throwing himself on his knees, my lord and lady, said he, I went to govern your island of Barataria, such being your will and pleasure, though it was your goodness more than my desert. Naked I entered into it, and naked I came away. I neither won nor lost. Whether I governed well or ill, there are those not far off can tell, and let them tell, if they please, that can tell better than I. I have resolved doubtful cases, determined lawsuits, and all the while ready to die for hunger, such was the pleasure of Dr. Pedro Rizio of Tertiafura, that physician in ordinary to island governors. Enemies set upon us in the night, and after they had put us in great danger, the people of the island say they were delivered and had the victory, and may heaven prosper them as they speak truth. In short, in that time I experienced all the cares and burdens this trade of governing brings along with it, and I found them too heavy for my shoulders. I was never cut out for a ruler, and I am too clumsy to meddle with edge tools, and so, before the government left me, I even resolved to leave the government, and accordingly, yesterday morning I quitted the island as I found it, with the same streets, the same houses, and the same lives to them as when I came to it. I have asked for nothing by way of loan and have made no war against a rainy day. I designed, indeed, to have issued out several wholesome orders, but did not, for fear they should not be kept, 
in which case it signifies no more to make them than if one made them not. So, as I said before, I came away from the island without any company but my tadpole. I fell into a cave and went a good way through it, till this morning, by the light of the sun, I spied my way out, yet not so easy but, had not heaven sent my master, Don Quixote, to help me, there I might have stayed till doomsday. And now, my lord duke and my lady duchess, here is your governor Sancho Panza again, who, by a ten days government, has only picked up so much experience as to know he would not give a straw to be a governor, not only of an island, but of the whole world. This being allowed, kissing your honor's hands, and doing like the boys when they play at truss or sail, who cry, leap you, and then let me leap, so I leap from the government to my old master's service again. Thus Sancho concluded his speech, and Don Quixote, who all the while dreaded he would have said a thousand impertinencies, was glad in his heart, finding him end with so few. The duke embraced Sancho, and told him he was very sorry he had quitted his government so soon, but that he would give him some other employment that should be less troublesome and more profitable. The duchess was no less kind, giving order he should want for nothing, for he seemed sadly bruised and out of order. Chapter 86 Of the extraordinary and unaccountable combat between Don Quixote de la Mancha and the lackey Tosilos in vindication of the matron Donna Rodriguez's daughter. The day appointed for the combat was now come, nor had the duke forgotten to give his lackey, Tosilos, all requisite instructions how to vanquish Don Quixote and yet neither kill nor wound him, to which purpose he gave orders that the spears or steel heads of their lances should be taken off, making Don Quixote sensible that Christianity, for which he had so great a veneration, did not admit that such conflicts should so much endanger the lives of the combatants and that it was enough he granted him free lists in his territories, though it was against the decree of the Holy Council, which forbids such challenges, for which reason he desired them not to push the thing to the utmost rigor. Don Quixote replied that his grace had the sole disposal of all things, and it was only his duty to obey. And now, the dreadful day being come, the duke caused a spacious scaffold to be erected for the judges of the field of battle and for the matron and her daughter, the plaintiffs. An infinite number of people flocked from all the neighboring towns and villages to behold the wonderful combat, the like of which had never been seen or so much as heard of in these parts. The first that made his entrance at the barriers was the marshal of the field who came to survey the ground and wrote all over it that there might be no foul play, nor private holes, nor contrivance to make one stumble or fall. After that entered the matron and her daughter, who seated themselves in their places, all in deep mourning, with no small demonstration of sorrow. Presently, at one end of the field, appeared the peerless champion, Don Quixote de la Mancha, a while after, at the other, entered the grand lackey, Tosilos, attended with a great number of trumpets and mounted on mighty steed that shook the very earth. The valorous combatant came on, well tutored by the duke his master how to behave himself towards Don Quixote, being one to spare his life by all means, and therefore to avoid a shock in his first career that might otherwise prove fatal, should he encounter him directly, Tosilos fetched a compass about the barrier and at last made a stop right against the two women, casting a curious eye upon her that had demanded him in marriage. Then the marshal of the field called to Don Quixote and, in presence of Tosilos, asked the mother and the daughter whether they consented that Don Quixote de la Mancha should vindicate their right and whether they would stand or fall by the fortune of their champion. They said they did, and allowed of whatever he should do in their behalf as good and valid. The Duke and Duchess were now seated in a gallery that was over the barriers, which were surrounded by a vast throng of spectators, 
all waiting to see the terrible and unprecedented conflict. The conditions of the combat were these, that if Don Quixote were the conqueror, his opponent should marry Donna Rodriguez's daughter, but if the knight were overcome, then the victor should be discharged from his promise. Then the marshal of the field placed each of them on the spot whence he should start, dividing equally between them the advantage of the ground that neither of them might have the sun in his eyes. And now the drums beat, and the clang of the trumpets resounded through the air, the earth shook under them, and the hearts of the numerous spectators were in suspense, some fearing, others expecting, the good or bad issue of the battle. Don Quixote, recommending himself to heaven and his lady Dulcinea del Toboso, stood expecting when the precise signal for the onset should be given. But our lackey's mind was otherwise employed, and all his thoughts were upon what I am going to tell you. It seems, as he stood looking on his female enemy, she appeared to him the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his whole life, which being perceived by the little blind archer to whom the world gives the name of love, he took his advantage, and, fond of improving his triumphs, though it were but over a lackey, he came up to him softly, and, without being perceived by anyone, he shot an arrow two yards long into the poor footman's side, so smartly that his heart was pierced through and through a thing which the mischievous boy could easily do, for love is invisible and has free ingress or egress where he pleases at a most unaccountable rate. You must know, then, that when the signal for the onset was given, our lackey was in an ecstasy transported with the thoughts of the beauty of his lovely enemy, insomuch that he took no manner of notice of the trumpet's sound, quite contrary to Don Quixote, who no sooner heard it than, clapping spurs to his horse, he began to make towards the enemy with Rosinante's best speed. Tosilo saw Don Quixote come towards him, yet, Instead of taking his career to encounter him without leaving the place he called as loud as he could to the marshal of the field, Sir, said Tosilos, is not this duel to be fought that I may marry yonder young lady or let it alone? Yes, answered the marshal. Why, then, said the lackey, I feel a burden upon my conscience and am sensible I should have a great deal to answer for, should I proceed any farther in this combat, and therefore I yield myself vanquished, and desire I may marry the lady this moment. The marshal of the field was surprised, and as he was privy to the duke's contrivance of that business, the lackey's unexpected submission put him to such a nonplus that he knew not what to answer. On the other side, Don Quixote stopped in the middle of his career, seeing his adversary did not put himself in a posture of defense. The Duke could not imagine why the business of the field was at a stand, but the marshal having informed him, he was amazed and in a great passion. In the meantime, Tosilos, approaching Donna Rodriguez, Madam, cried he, I am willing to marry your daughter, there is no need of lawsuits nor combats in the matter, I have rather make an end of it peaceably and without the hazard of body and soul. Why, then, said the valorous Don Quixote, hearing this, since it is so, I am discharged of my promise, let them even marry in God's name and heaven bless them and give them joy. At the same time the Duke, coming down within the lists, and applying himself to Tosilos, tell me, knight, said he, is it true that ye yield without fighting, and that, at the instigation of your timorous conscience, you are resolved to marry this damsel? Yes, if it please your grace, answered Tosilos. Mary, and I think it the wisest course, quoth Sancho, for what says the proverb? What the mouse would get, give the cat, and keep thyself out of trouble. In the meanwhile, Tosilos began to unlace his helmet and called out that somebody might help him off with it quickly, as being so choked with his armor that he was scarce able to breathe. With that, they took off his helmet with all speed, and then the lackey's face was plainly discovered. 
Donna Rodriguez and her daughter perceiving it presently, a cheat a cheat, cried they, they have got Tosilos, my lord Duke Slacky, to counterfeit my lawful husband, justice of heaven and the kingness is a piece of malice and treachery not to be endured. Ladies, said Don Quixote, do not vex yourselves, there is neither malice nor treachery in the case, or, if there be, the duke is not in fault. No, these evil-minded necromancers that persecute me are the traitors, who, envying the glory I should have got by this combat, have transformed the face of my adversary into this, which you see is the duke's lackey. But take my advice, madam, added he to the daughter, and, in spite of the baseness of my enemies, marry him, for I dare engage it is the very man you claim as your husband. The duke, hearing this, angry as he was, could hardly forbear losing his indignation and laughter. Truly, said he, so many extraordinary accidents every day befall the great Don Quixote that I am inclined to believe this is not my lackey, though he appears to be so. But, for our better satisfaction, let us defer the marriage but a fortnight, and in the meanwhile keep in close custody this person that has put us into this confusion, Perhaps by that time he may resume his former looks, for, doubtless, the malice of those mischievous magicians against the noble Don Quixote cannot last so long, especially when they find all these tricks and transformations of so little avail. Alacaday, sir, quoth Sancho, those plaguy imps are not so soon tired as you think, for where my master is concerned, they used to form and deform, and chop and change this into that, and that into the other. It is but a little while ago that they transmogrified the Knight of the Mirrors, whom he had overcome, into a special acquaintance of ours, the bachelor Samson Carrasco, of our village, and as for the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso, our mistress, they have bewitched and bedeviled her into the shape of a mere country blouse, and so I verily think this saucy fellow here is likely to live a footman all the days of his life. Well, cried the daughter, let him be what he will, if he will have me, I will have him. I ought to thank him, for I had rather be a lackey's wife than is that deluded me, who has proved himself no gentleman. To be short, the sum of the matter was that Tosilo should be confined to see what his transformation would come to. Don Quixote was proclaimed victor by general consent, and the people went away, most of them very much out of humor, because the combatants had not cut one another to pieces to make them sport, according to the custom of the young rabble, who are sorry when, after they have stayed in hopes to see a man hanged, he happens to be pardoned either by the party he has wronged or the magistrate. The crowd being dispersed, the Duke and Duchess returned with Don Quixote into the castle, Tosilos was secured and kept close. As for Donna Rodriguez and her daughter, they were very well pleased to see, one way or another, that the business would end in marriage, and Tosilos flattered himself with the like expectation.